Okay. Um, thanks very much, Doreen. Thank you for that generous and thoughtful welcome. And thanks uh, to everybody for coming along. Um, so uh, this is the second year I've been teaching here at CCC. And uh, I, I teach this particular seminar called Theory Fiction. And last year, the seminar was based around the work of the Iranian philosopher Reza Negrestani. Uh, and it was focused specifically on his book from 2009, Cyclonopedia, Complicity with Anonymous Materials. And in this book, Negrestani thinks the question of the civilization of the Middle East in relation to the question of the petropolitical in relation to what he calls uh, the Tellurian dynamics of the earth, in relation to what he calls the abyssal uh, dynamics of the cosmos, to conclude that it is not a question of what we think of oil, but how oil thinks through us. And this was the starting point for last year's seminar, and we linked it to the framework of the Joint Cooperative Plan of Agreement um, between America, Iran, and several other nations. Um, our seminar took place within that frame, uh, the frame of sep you know, September to January. We adopted the time frame, the real time frame of this political process, and tried to situate Negrostani's thought within this contemporary framework. So effectively, we try to think of, um, we try to imagine a sequel to Psychonopedia that was set in Switzerland. So that was last year's seminar. And this year's seminar is based around um, a new uh, formulation of the relation between theory and fiction. Negrostani's was about, in a way, the relation between philosophy and horror, and the relation between the human and the non human. And this year, the relation between theory and fiction goes by way of finance. I think since 2008, um, we've heard a lot about how the complexity of the global financial markets uh, renders representation impossible. That global finance is too complex, too demanding, too abstract, both for uh, the, the, the traders on the market themselves and certainly for non-economic people, non-finance people to understand. At the same time, of course, that finance in a way towers over sovereign states and in a way um, captures the sovereignty of national states. We're also told that finance is something that civilians have to bear, they have to manage. Um, so the, the premise for this year's seminar was to think the relation between um, fiction and finance through a particular set of texts and through one particular text, a, you know, a pulp fiction by the, the, um, the British airport thriller novelist uh, Robert Harris, a book called The Fear Index. It's the kind of book you see in an airport and you leave it there. <coughs> I've certainly left it there for years. And but then it started intriguing me because what I realised when I read it was that Harris was one of the first novelists, if not the first, to attempt to narrate the events of May 6th, 2010. Uh, on that day, May 6th, 2010, there was an emergent phenomena, uh, a black swan, a dragon king, uh, an ultra-fast extreme event that in a way announced the emergent rhythms, the inner dynamics and the external events of an automated financial market. And in a way this had been formulating and developing since the 90s. In the 70s already, um, <laughs> Fisher Black, who is to win the Nobel Prize, along with Myron Scholes and Robert Merton, for coming up with a formula for pricing options, which became the basis for the derivatives market. He already, in the 70s, kind of dreamt wistfully of a fully automated market, which could do away with humans altogether. And gradually, 
through the Chicago Mercantile Ex- Mercantile Exchange Board in the 70s and the 80s, this dream of an automated market gradually emerged. But I would say that, in a way, we would we still had a popular imagination of the market as guys in braces, gesturing frantically, gesticulating, making expressions, white guys with shirts, talking to each other loudly in what they call the open outcry pit. That was a kind of popular, popular perception if we thought about the financial market at all. That's how we understood it. But the flash crash of 2010 kind of changed that because it shocked enough people within the market. This is the same market that had crashed the economies of many countries. Even these hard-bitten characters were shocked by what happened on the 6th of May 2010. They couldn't really understand what was at stake. So then I became impressed by the fact that Robert Harris you know, this journeyman novelist, was able to narrate what had happened in 6th May 2010 and was able to connect that to this city itself. So the novel is set in Geneva and it's set in one day in May when the flash crash happens in the background. So this paper is going to talk about three things broadly. And so for the people who take my seminar, it's going to be quite familiar but you know, for everybody else, it's a way to um, it's a way to kind of invite everybody into the conversation that we have in our seminar, and and um, and the seminar is based on the fact that none of us are economists, or traders, or financiers, or mathematicians, or quants, and so the point very much is what non-economic people do with economics, how we narrate the non-human temporalities and the non-human speeds of financial markets whose sovereignty dominates our lives, despite us not having a vocabulary for it, despite us being blind to it, and despite us being effectively banished from its orbits and its precincts. I was saying today to the seminar, I've never met a trader, never ever. I mean, they're all over the city of London, but they stick to themselves. Um, and so this um, seminar is very much um, a collective process in which we confront our ignorance. So to begin, I'm going to play just uh, the first section of a short video uh, by the Austrian uh, researcher Gerard Nessler, who's based at uh, the Centre for Research Architecture in London and whose research in the years of 2013-14 uh, were really heavily focused around a forensic analysis of the flash crash. So we won't get into the entire detail of his project, but just the first two to three minutes will give you a sense of of the, the terrain. And so I'll start by trying to map out how what an automated financial market, how it functions. And then I'll move on to an analysis of uh, Robert Harris. And then there'll be a kind of, um, not exactly an addendum, not exactly a part three, but a kind of a reopening that returns to the same subjects through another route. Okay, so thank you to Melissa and Camilla for putting up with my last-minute demands, and hopefully this will work fine. Do we have sound? Mm-hmm. Sound is important. Ten fifty-three. so 90 handles? That's too much. Four even bid here now, guys. Four even. You're talking about a thousand dial points. You know, it's just too much. This is the voice of Ben Lichtenstein. He reports live from the futures trading floors in Chicago, USA, for traders who are not locals but spread around the world. Paper came in. Huge paper sellers coming through here, guys. We got fast market up on the board. It is May the 6th, 
2010, and his voice is about to become known beyond the secretive world of financial markets. Are trading here now, guys. Oh, they're very bad. Guys, 82 evens are trading. 81 evens are trading here now, guys. 79s are trading. You got 79s trading here. You are listening to Lichtenstein's live coverage of what was later termed the flash crash, the biggest one-day market decline in financial history. 70 even bid here now, guys. 70 even bid at 80. 70. Stop it. It's got to hit a limit. The Dow Jones Index plunged almost 1,000 points in a matter of minutes, only to recover the losses in short order. Once again, at 75. Guys, this is probably the craziest I've seen it down here ever. Live on TV, CNBC delivered breaking news from Wall Street to a global audience. TV pundits quickly adopted a phrase that was reported live from the trading floor. Uh, you're there. What, what, is, what is the talk? What happens from here? And what are people saying? Now you're down 800. Yeah, Aaron, and they're saying when I asked them what the heck is going on down here, uh, I don't know. There is fear. This is capitulation, really. The flash crash epitomized a development that has shaped financial markets since the mid-2000s. Computer-based high-frequency trading, or HFT, is defined by transactions executed automatically, at nearly the speed of light. In the 1990s, a trade executed by humans took about 12 seconds. Today, automated high-frequency trading orders, are sent in up to 740 nanoseconds, or 0.74 microseconds, or 0.0000074 seconds. Grace Hopper, a leading computer expert and former U.S. Rear Admiral, explains nanoseconds. They started talking about circuits that acted in nanoseconds, billionths of a second. Oh, I didn't know what a billion was. I don't think most of those men downtown know what a billion is either. <laughs> and uh, if you don't know what a billion is, how on earth do you know what a billionth is? Finally, one morning, in total desperation, I called over to the engineering building. And I said, please cut off a nanosecond and send it over to me. And I've brought you some today. Now, what I wanted when I asked for a nanosecond was, I wanted a piece of wire which would represent the maximum distance that electricity could travel in a billionth of a second. Now, of course, it wouldn't really be through wire. It'd be out in space, velocity of light. So if you start with a velocity of light and use your friendly computer, you'll discover that a nanosecond is 11.8 inches long. The maximum limiting distance that electricity can travel in a billionth of a second. Finally, at the end of about a week, I called back and said, I need something to compare this to. Could I please have a microsecond? I've only got one microsecond, so I can't give you each one. Here's a microsecond. 984 feet. I sometimes think we ought to hang one over every programmer's desk or around the neck. So they know what they're throwing away when they throw away microseconds. And Admiral wanted to know why it took so damn long to send a message by a satellite. And I had to point out that between here and the satellite, there were a very large number of nanoseconds. What's limited admirals? Be okay. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to read this. Uh, so hopefully everybody can hear me. Okay. So, strange periodicities, odd spasms. The most striking periodicity involves large peaks of activity separated by almost exactly 1,000 milliseconds. A millisecond is a thousandth of a second. The periodic periodicities occur 10 to 30 milliseconds after the tick of each second. The spasms seem to be governed, not directly by clock time, but by an event, the execution of a buy or sell order, the cancellation of an order, the arrival of a new order. Average activity levels in the first millisecond after such an event. There are lengthy periods lengthy to be precise on a scale that is measured in thousands of a second, in which little or nothing happens. 
punctuated by spasms of thousands of orders for the shares of a corporation and the cancellations of orders. These spasms seem to begin abruptly, they last a minute or two minutes, and then they end just as abruptly. And so these periodicities, these spasms, were analysed by the economists Hasbrook and Saar back in 2010. And what they tell us, for those who can read them, is an epochal shift. What they indicate is numbers reacting reflexively to each other according to a nervous system of automated algorithms. What they signal to us is the emergent dynamics of a new financial universe that operates beneath human action and below human perception. Humans cannot react to an event in a millisecond or in a thousand of a second. It takes a chess grandmaster approximately 650 milliseconds to realise they've been checkmated. For humans to consciously acknowledge and react to an event requires 5,000 milliseconds. The fastest response is approximately 140 milliseconds for the simplest stimulus, such as a sudden sound. 100 milliseconds, or a tenth of a second, is the approximate threshold of the human perception of time, the threshold around which cinematography, the human sciences, and the biophysical sciences continually test the limits of the species. So what underpins the internal rhythms of this new financial universe? It is the technological regime of the computational algorithm. The spasms and the spikes, the crashes and the peaks, the troughs and the periodicities index the internal dynamics of financial market price movements, which are determined by the self-organising activity of global collective trading agents that include humans and machine algorithms. Automated trading dissects seconds into computational fractions and carries out sub-temporal operations in order to gain trading advantage and to influence future prices on levels that are invisible to human perception. Today, automation has infiltrated every part of the global financial market. Financial markets are now the world's largest and most data-rich examples of an ultra-fast, self-organising, socio-technical system that has no real-time controller. There is no central intelligence agency that has oversight or understanding of the dynamics of the system. There is no single scientific theory, no single empirical study that has advanced any general principles or has matched the underlying human machine ecology that is operating now at ultra fast timescales. As the sociologist of finance Donald McKenzie points out in his article called How to Make Money in a Microsecond, which is on London Review of Books, and it's where I took the opening quote from, and it's where this, in fact, it's where I get the information from for this opening section. The popular image of the financial market still depicted in films and television to this day is the scene from the so-called open outcry trading pits at places like the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. You know, hundreds of sweating, shouting white male guys gesticulating gesturing, yelling, signalling, white men doing deeds, face to face. The confrontational machismo of the open cry pit bears no resemblance to the sub-rhythms of the automated financial market investigated by economists, which we saw a bit of in Gerard's video. 
Today, in fact, most markets, many markets, at least in products like shares and stocks, look like, and in fact are, giant air-conditioned warehouses. They are full of computers, supervised by a handful of male maintenance staff. The deals that used to be struck by elaborate hand signals on the trading floor have gone, replaced by, by, excuse me, replaced by matching engines, which are computer systems that process, buy, and sell orders. It is these systems, these matching engines, which execute a trade if they find a buy order and a sell order that matches. So as Mackenzie insists, and as we can see in a very good recent documentary by the artist and researcher Boaz Levin called All That Is Solid Melts Into Air, the, the matching engines of the New York Stock Exchange of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange are not located in those places. The engines are not found within the New York Stock Exchange that we know, the one in Broad Street with its Corinthian columns and its sculptures and its neoclassical facade. No. The matching engines are located in a 400,000 square foot data center in Marwa in New Jersey, which is 30 miles from downtown Manhattan. Tourists like to take selfies outside of the New York Stock Exchange in Broad Street. They do it all the time. But nobody's taking selfies outside the Marwa data center because it's fenced, it's patrolled, it's policed, and it is classified as part of the critical infrastructure of the USA. It looks like a giant hard drive. Most data centers do. So when financial trading was a matter of human beings looking at screens or shouting like we fondly imagine it still to be, the intrinsic slowness of human eyes and brains and fingers masked the disparities in the time that it took to transfer data from New York to Chicago to Tokyo to London, to Singapore. But now that computers do the trading, geography, as Donald McKenzie says, geography matters exquisitely. Geography matters exquisitely. So whatever technologies are being used, whether it's fiber optic cable or microwave, whether it's millimeter waves or laser transmissions, the exact route is crucial. So human beings still work from their computers. They still send their trades from their computers to their matching engines. But this accounts for less than half of shares traded in the US now. The rest is traded algorithmically. It results from share trading computer programs. And there's a wide range of these computer programs. There's a wide range of financial firms and funds that incorporate different kinds of algorithms. Some of them are used by mutual funds, by pension funds, by insurance companies. And these firms tend to use what is called execution algorithms, which take large orders and break them up into smaller slices and then choose the size of those slices and the times at which they send them to the market. And the most common execution algorithm is known as a volume weighted average price, or VWAP, an algorithm which slices orders according to statistical data on the volumes of shares that have traded in the equivalent time periods on previous days. So when the economist Hasbrook and Saar looked at that sub-second landscape, the clock time periodicities that they found almost certainly came from the way these VWAP execution algorithms chopped time into intervals of fixed length. And the other major class of algorithms are designed to make money by trading 
And it is these algorithms that give rise to the spasm that Hasbrook and Saar found. These are called electronic market-making algorithms, and they try to replicate what human market makers have always tried to do. They continually post a price at which they will sell the shares of a corporation, and at a low and a lower price at which they will buy shares, in the hope of earning the spread between the higher and the lower price. But the trick is that they revise prices as market conditions change. They revise prices as the volatility of the market continually changes. And they revise these much faster than any human being could ever do. And what they do is produce a continuous flood of orders and cancellations, which follow even the most minor changes in supply and demand. So at the cutting edge of this kind of ecology of financial automation that I'm describing, what we can see are firms involved in HFT, so-called high-frequency trading. These are firms involved in a competition for milliseconds of trading advantage. These are the firms involved in what is called the race to zero. These are the firms that use things such as the I we execute purpose built chip, which prepares trades in 740 nanoseconds. If you remember from Grace Hopper, one nanosecond is a billionth of a second. So it is high frequency trading operating at the temporal depth of the nanosecond that triggers the turbulence and the volatility of the flash crash. And that's what I want to look at in a bit more detail today. So as uh, the theorists Nick Cernicek and Alex Williams uh, argue in their brilliant essay on cunning automata, financial acceleration at the limits of the dromological, the external, or let's say the total ecological effect of all of these changes, of all of these innovations, has been to replace the popular image of what a global financial market is. And that popular image was a casino, a casino that was rigged. But they argued that this image of the market as a casino should be replaced with a new regime in which technology redefines the risk landscape itself. Instead of thinking of the market as a rigged game, in which the casino or the house always wins, think instead of a financial universe of technical engines trading as close to the speed of light as possible. In his great book, The Flash Boys, Cracking the Money Code, a best-selling journalistic expose, um, the journalist Michael Lewis writes, from 2006 to 2008, High frequency traders' share of total US stock market trading doubled from 26 to 52%, and it has never fallen below 50%. The total number of trades made in the stock market has spiked from roughly 10 million per day in 2006 to just over 20 million per day in 2009. <coughs> High frequency trading according to most estimates, now accounts for over 70% of equity market volumes in the US and over a third in the UK. High frequency trading then is an influential force in modern markets. Some firms refuse any human intervention in their automated processes. Some firms work with assemblages of human and non-human entities. In some firms, machine-readable data continually flows into the algorithms so that trading decisions are made automatically. And it's at this point that HFT systems interact to produce emergent phenomena such as financial flash crashes and ultra-fast <coughs> swans, the ones we just saw. And so high-frequency trading effectively reverses and inverts the 
previously anthropocentically explicable processes of capital. This is Cernicek and Williams' argument. High frequency trading effectively carries out an anthropic inversion. It decenters the human. And one of the effects of this decentering is the phenomena of the financial flash crash. So, just to recap, at 2.42 p.m. on the 6th of May, 2010, Eastern Daylight Standard Time, the Dow Jones Stock Index falls 600 points in five minutes. This is the single largest decline in 114 years. In five minutes, humans and machine in human and machine interactions generate an unprecedented system crash. This is a fall of almost unprecedented rapidity. Usually markets change by a maximum of between one to two percent in a whole day. This time six hundred points fell in five minutes. Equally disturbing to traders is that despite these gigantic fluctuations, overall prices actually recovered almost as quickly. Some of the shares, some of the fluctuations were bizarre. Accenture, for example, had been trading at around $40.50, but dropped to a single cent. Sotheby's, which had been trading at around $34, suddenly jumped to $99,999.99 cents. <laughs> so what happened between 2.40 and 3 p.m.? What happened? Well, it's easy to work out that it was an internal crisis not so much a response to the Eurozone debt crisis or to the Greek crisis. What Donald Mackenzie analysed was that from around 2.41pm, algorithms started to sell futures and the electronic futures market entered into a spasm. One algorithm would sell futures to another algorithm, which in turn would try to sell them again in a pattern that investigators called hot potato trading. And in the 14 second period, following 2.45 and 13 seconds, more than 27,000 futures contracts were bought and sold by algorithms. By 2.45 and 27 seconds, the price of futures had declined by more than 5%. So at this point, the market has entered into a catastrophic, self-feeding downward spiral, entered into negative feedback. The trading platform on which these futures are being bought and sold is called the Globex system, and it belongs to the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And the Globex system is programmed to detect just such a downward spiral. And so when prices reach a preset level, a stop is triggered automatically by the automated system. And this is called <clears throat> stop logic functionality. And stop logic functionality is designed to interrupt self-feeding downward crashes and upward price spikes. So the goal of stop logic functionality is to halt this process to give traders time to assess what is happening, to step in and to pick up bargains if they can. So at 2.45 and 28 seconds, the price falls triggered Globex's stop logic functionality, a five second pause. And this was enough uh, so that the trader Alison Crossweight could later say, the five-second pause provided ample time for market participants to consider their positions and return to the market or not, depending on the conclusions they reached. It allowed market participants to regain confidence. The regaining of confidence. 
is what matters to regulators and to traders above all else. So a year later, Andrew Haldane, who's the executive director of financial stability of the Bank of England, was giving a lecture at the International Economic Association at its 16th World Congress in Beijing. And his lecture was called The Race to Zero. And one year later, nobody knew what had happened. This is what Haldane said. The so-called flash crash sent shockwaves through global equity markets. For a time, equity prices of some of the world's biggest companies were in freefall. They appeared to be in a race to zero. We remain unsure quite what caused the flash crash or whether it could recur. And this conclusion sits uneasily on our shoulders because asset markets rely on accurate pricing of risk and financial regulation relies on an accurate reading of markets. So whether trading assets or regulating exchanges, ignorance is rarely bliss. It is this uncertainty rather than the flash crash itself, which makes this an issue of potential systemic importance. So how is this uncertainty investigated and interpreted? How is such an unprecedented black swan event narrated within, and more importantly, beyond financial markets? How does the non-human complexity of the flash crash as an emergent phenomena of global markets become narrated when it vastly outstrips the cognitive capacities of the human experience. The flash crash left experienced traders alienated, moving through a world that no longer corresponded to their experiences. It insisted upon a rift between structure and experience a rift that had already taken place. It confronted them with the implications of the rift that they had already implemented. And already in the 80s, Jameson, Frederick Jameson, had argued that under conditions of late capitalism, structure supersedes experience to the extent that structure is no longer accessible to the subject of experience which in turn produces a particular form of experiential alienation at the level of the phenomenal subject. And so we're familiar with Brecht, uh, Brecht's arguments about the, the, the need to go beyond the filming and the photographing and the picturing of Ige Farben. We're familiar with Eisenstein's inability to film Das Kapital. And so those confrontations that those figures faced, in a sense, the flash crash is our version of that kind of confrontation. So faced with this cognitive discrepancy, the discrepancy between structure and experience, two options emerge. Two options emerge which have not really been taken up. One is to reduce non-human complexity to a human level. The other is to expand the capacity of the humanities and the human, and the human sciences, especially beyond economics, to interface with complexity. And in a way, the, the theory fiction seminar is, is trying to ex explore both. Trying to explore what uh, what has been called the manifest image and the scientific image. Not to, the manifest image, which is a phenomenal image, and the scientific image, which is an objective image, which decenters the manifest image. And in a way to make one play off and support the other. So even as the regulators embarked upon their investigation into the flash into those five minutes. In order to restore confidence in global markets, the British novelist Robert Harris took note of the flash crash and sought to suture the cognitive lacunae 
that opened up between structure and experience. So now I want to turn to Robert Harris's Fear Index, not only because it's the first fiction to engage with the flash crash, but because it's a kind of staging ground for what Cernicek and Williams call a folk politics, in which the confrontation with alienation is scaled down to a human level that manifests itself in terms of temporal, spatial, and conceptual immediacy, instead of scaling up towards the challenges of abstraction and objectification. Okay, so this is an interview with Robert Harris from I think 2012. It's about eight minutes. I'll just play. Um, I'll play the first few minutes. I mean, he's he's a he's a kind of pompous British novelist, but. You know, in a way, that's that's part of the that's part of the beauty. It's part of what gives him the chutzpah to do this project. Corruption, politics, and power. And fortunately, he can take all those elements to tell a great story. He started as a journalist back in the UK covering politics and got pretty close to some influential people, including a young up-and-coming politician, Tony Blair. And years later, when Blair ran for prime minister, he gave Robert privileged access to his campaign, giving him a glimpse into what drives people to pursue power. You have put your trust in me, and I intend to repay that trust. I will not let you down. But as much as he loved journalism, Robert found there were things you can't say in a newspaper, so he turned to the books and fiction. His first novel was called Fatherland, a provocative story about what life would have been like if the Nazis won the Second World War. It was a big success, that book, and to date, Robert's written eight books, including The Ghost, which was made into a film by Roman Polanski. It's because I know nothing about politics that I'll ask the questions that get right to the heart of who Adam Lang is. And that is what sells autobiographies. Knowing what we know about Roman's past, how do you reconcile working with him? We'll ask Robert about that. And also about his new novel. It's called The Fear Index, about a physicist who devises a way to measure and predict human emotion and uses it to manipulate the markets. It's pretty frightening because that impulse to do that, not that far-fetched, and not because it's futuristic, but because it ain't. They're quite shifty, the physicists. I mean, they've been trained to use their brains for science, and they're putting them totally at the service of making money. Please welcome the program, Robert Harris. Nice to see you, sir. Hi, nice to meet you. you. Nice to see you. Thank you. I, um, I love the fact that you write this book, you're dealing with the financial business, and you open with a Frankenstein quote. Oh, yes. <laughs> That's how scary this really is, isn't it? Yeah, no, I wanted to write uh, the most frightening book I could about the world financial markets. It wasn't too hard, I can tell you. The, when did the idea come? Just after the big collapse, or was it building in your head before that? Building in my head before that. I'm a great fan of George Orwell and I wanted to write a kind of modern version in 1984, but it struck me that it wasn't the state that people are frightened of anymore, it's corporations using new technology. And then when the F Lehman Brothers, the collapse happened, I realized that actually the financial markets are dominated by computers, and they are actually quite out of control, so that, that became the starting point of the book. Well, you had access to some of the people that we only hear about in titles. Yes. We hear about hedge fund managers. We don't know these people. We just hear their names. But you spent, did you, is there a common thread in their personality? Could you see the core of what makes the person really want to do this for a living? Well, there's two types. Uh, there's the traders, which are the traditional, you know, kind of guys you see in the Oliver Stone movie. But then increasingly, there are these people called quants, uh, short for quantitative analysts Quantum and they are quant sounds like a pejorative <laughs> uh, they, they are uh, physicists uh, mathematicians scientists generally and they are really in it for the theories and they are increasingly driving the markets it, it's it's an entire business based on speculation and yeah, fear. it's it's a, it's a grand uh, casino and there's huge money made i mean there was one guy in geneva where they pay 8.8% tax, incidentally, which makes Mitt Romney look like an incredibly <laughs> generous <laughs> donator to the government. And the, uh, he sat down opposite me and I've, f f at a restaurant in Geneva and I said, uh, how are things going? And he said, oh, pretty well. I made $700 million on Thursday. Um, and I bought the meal, which is the thing. <laughs> <laughs> Which is most annoying. Uh, <laughs> but the, the, the amount of money that's made is uh, phenomenal. Well, and because there is that ability to make money, there will be all kinds of people looking to 
tilt the system in their favour. Yeah, the, I mean, the system's got out of control. I, my novel is set on the 6th of May 2010, which was the day of this so-called flash crash. And um, uh, on that one day in New York, 19.1 billion shares were traded. That is more traded on that one day than in the whole decade of the 1960s. 75% uh, of shares are traded by computers, which is what's in my novel, and the average length of time a share is held in America is now 22 seconds. Uh, so, you know, you've got to get rid of the old, you know, model in your head of what the financial markets are like. They're super fast, they're trillions of dollars, they're controlled by scientists, or not even not controlled by, they run and, and operated by uh, quants, and uh, the system is out of control, I think. You politicians don't know what to do. It's about who has power here in a lot of ways, isn't it? Yeah. You, which is not a, an, an uncommon theme for you. You like exploring power. Yeah, power about ancient Rome or about Nazi Germany and Fatherland or uh, the ghost writer about an uh, ex-prime minister. But really, if you want to know power, the bond market, the financial markets and people whose names we don't know who are making uh, billions of dollars. Who interests you more, the powerful or the powerless? Um, I see myself as writing uh, about people who are in pursuit. That's enough. Yes. They, should, they should let him finish that statement. Really? Yeah. Okay. He's just so pompous. Yeah. Pursuit okay. of power. And I write, try to write about them from the perspective of the powerless. I mean, mostly in my <laughs> novels, the true. essential <laughs> characters are struggling or they're on the periphery. <laughs> Uh, you know, like, say, the ghostwriter figure I with an ex <laughs> 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 The untrue. He's such an ass kid. Oh my god. <coughs> it's just not true that he writes from the perspective of the powerless. Okay. So, so that was Robert Harris um, in 2012. Um, just, you know, on the, on the publicity circuit, promoting his book, The Fear Index. So, I'm going to talk a bit about The Fear Index now as the first popular attempt to narrate the flash crash beyond, in a sense, beyond expertise. So, so Harris is angling to, to get the first draft of history. He's trying to set the terms upon which the vast majority of the public, who, who still struggle to grasp this, he's aiming to be the guy who scripts that response. So, uh, the Fear Index is about a figure called Dr. Alexander Hoffman, who's a scientist, American, who's working at the beginning of the novel, before the novel starts. He's based here, in Geneva, at CERN, at the Large Hadron Collider. And after six years of work at CERN, Hoffman is lured into the finance world, not because he wants to work in finance, but because the finance world will provide him with the resources to continue his research. CERN have blocked his research because the algorithms that Hoffman has programmed have gone viral, and they've threatened CERN's systems. So as the fear index starts, VIXAL4, V-I-X-A-L, VIXAL4, the trading algorithm that underpins Hoffman Investment Technologies, the hedge fund that has made Alexander Hoffman wealthy, has become autonomous. And now it is trading as an intelligence of its own. It's controlling the market, it's managing trades, it's making a profit. It is indifferent to and independent of the humans whose lives it affects. And Hoffman has to reconstruct who the enemy is. At the beginning, he doesn't suspect Vixal 4, but he has to prevent his algorithm from crashing his company, destroying his marriage, and ruining the global economy, all in its drive to maximise profits. So as Arna de Bove points out in his recent essay, Creatures of Panic, financial realism in the fear index. Part of what makes the book engaging is that Harris actually suggests that it is Vixal 4 that is responsible for the flash crash. 
And so chapter 16 of the fear index begins as follows. What was officially logged as general system malfunction occurred at Hoffman Investment Technologies at 7 p.m. Central European time. At exactly the same moment, almost 4,000 miles away, at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, unusual activity was detected on the New York Stock Exchange. Several dozen stocks began to be affected by severe price volatility of such magnitude that it automatically triggered what are known as liquidity replenishment points, or LRPs. And in her subsequent testimony to Congress, the chairman of the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission explained that LRPs, liquidity replenishment points, are best thought of as a speed bump (coughs) that are intended to dampen volatility in a given stock by temporarily converting an automated market into a manual auction market when a price movement of sufficient size is reached. So effectively what Harris has done is fictionalise the flash crash but document the regulator's response to it. So he's integrated both fiction, he's integrated documentary and he's re-narrated documentary as fiction. And his, uh, his fictional scientist turned quant, Alexander Hoffman, explains what VIXAL 4 actually is. He says the Chicago Board of Exchange, the one we heard in the Flash Crash film by Gerard Nessler, operates what is known as the S&P 500 Volatility Index, or VIX. This has been running in one form or another for 17 years. It is a ticker, for want of a better word. It tracks the prices of options on stocks traded in the S&P 500. Let's just say that what it does is show the implied volatility of the market for the coming months. It goes up and down, minute by minute. The higher the index, the greater the uncertainty in the market. So traders call it the fear index. And it is liquid itself, of course. There are VIX options and VIX futures available to trade and we trade them. So VIXL4 is programmed to search the web for incidences of fear and fear-related language. It is there to observe market correlations and then it places its trades on the basis of the data that it collects. It makes profits out of negative human emotions. Hoffman has designed VIXL4 as a software agent that learns through effective contagion, which it then generates itself. VIXL4 effectively optimises Brian Masumi's argument that the ability of affect to produce an economic effect more swiftly and surely than economics itself means that affect is a real condition. It is an intrinsic variable of the late capitalist system as infrastructural as a factory. So according to Hoffman, so Hoffman has a theory about the relation between the net, the market, and emotions. Hoffman's theory is that the process of continuous digitalization is itself creating an epidemic of fear. The rise in market volatility, in our opinion, is a function of digitalization, which is exaggerating human mood swings by the unprecedented dissemination of information via the internet. And as the theorist Elena Esposito explains in her essay, Digital Prophecies and Web Intelligence, it is this unprecedented dissemination of information via the net which at the same time increases the complexity of the criteria for filtering and selecting. So as the mass of data increases, 
so does the criteria for filtering and selecting that data. They happen simultaneously. In fact, they feed off each other. Esposito says something similar has been happening in financial markets that have been using computer techniques to derive indications of the trends of future behavior from the past behavior of the markets. The so-called implied volatility, which is what uh, Hoffman spoke about, Esposito is defined. She says implied volatility is not meant to provide a measure of the direction of market movements. It does not imply that markets are increasing or decreasing in movements. What implied volatility measures is their instability, whether they will be turbulent or whether they will be stable, whether they will be risky or whether they will be relatively reliable. And what happens, of course, in the fear index is, of course, that Vixal Ford does not just harvest from the net, but contributes to the turbulent, stable, turbulent, unstable risk and unreliability, and becomes an event in the financial universe that it intervenes in. It accelerates, mobilizes, and destabilizes the market further. So there's a strange footnote in the fear index. And Harris, he says, what happened on the US financial markets over the next two hours is entirely factual. It is drawn from congressional testimony and the joint report findings regarding the market events of May 6, 2010 by the regulators, the CFTC and the SEC. So Harris, at this point, is really keen to impress on readers that he has integrated documentary evidence of regulators' response to the crash. And it is at this point that the fear index becomes what uh, Anna de Bove calls financial realism. So many people talk about it as science fiction, or as a thriller, or as gothic, and it is all those things. It is, in many ways, a rewrite of Frankenstein. It is, in many ways, indebted to the myth of Prometheus and the myth of Faust. But de Beau's notion of financial realism argues that this is a realism that does not record so much the reality of a capitalist economy that is centred around material commodities, but a realism that tries to capture the reality of finance that is governed by digital agents and is centred around immaterial speculative instruments such as derivatives and mortgages and insurance policies. And he says that if capitalist realism always had trouble with representing the material reality of the commodity because it, it risked misrepresenting the spectrality of the commodity, then by contrast, the role of financial realism is to have recourse to fiction in order to capture what Marx called fictitious capital. That's to say, fictional realism is the precondition for the narration of fictitious capital. And this argument that there is not just a thematic relation between the thriller, science fiction, gothic, and finance, but there is a more co-constitutive relation between the fiction of novels and the fiction of finance. This argument is carried a bit further by the theorist Stephen Shaviro, uh, and his essay called Hyperbolic Futures, Speculative Finance and Speculative Fiction. And Shavira argues that speculative fiction traces and amplifies the processes of speculation upon the future, whether it is financial, whether it is technolo technological, whether, and sorry, 
the, the, the future, financial, technological, and otherwise, that shapes our society today. Our world today is composed as much of fictions as of actualities, as much of things that happen on screens as of things that we can see and touch. And these fictions are largely speculative in the sense that they are gambles on the future. They are wages on forces we do not and cannot know. Derivatives, the exotic financial instruments at the root of our troubles, are, strictly speaking, what Marx calls fictitious capital. These are titles to wealth that can never be exchanged for or transformed into actually existing goods and services. So Shavira's argument is that fictitious capital creates a condition in which market value vastly exceeds the total value of goods and services produced in the world today. The prices of these derivatives are not tethered to actual economic production. Instead, they are determined on the basis of partial differential equations, which can only be calculated by powerful computers. Wealth is thereby accumulated in the form of electronic records, which are highly volatile and almost purely phantasmatic. And these records, Shavira concludes, bear only the most tenuous relation to any underlying physical assets. Ten more minutes. Yeah, you can go on. Okay. Oh, yes. Okay. I think I'll... Yeah, I think I'll get to it. Okay. Okay. So Shavira says, only such fictional instruments are entirely speculative. But this does not mean they are without efficacy. If anything, financial fictions have a greater impact upon our everyday lives than actual physical production. And financial derivatives used to be called, he reminds us, futures contracts. And this phrase is still appropriate because the purpose of these speculative instruments is to enter into a contractual relation with the future, to measure it, to quantify it, to assign an owner to it, and to put a present-day price upon all its contingencies. Only fiction, then, can capture the reality of fictitious capital, and only speculative fiction can capture speculative finance. But the question is, can we even speak of fictitious capital anymore? in a financial universe of automated trading, of derivatives, of derivatives, of derivatives? And if so, what kind of finance counts as real capital? Okay, so I'm going to move over Marx's definition of fictitious capital, and then I'm going to jump to the conclusion. Perhaps the problem with literature, the problem with the fear index, is that its preference for traditional narrative fails to confront the emergent phenomena of the algorithmic, to write the reality of the digital entities that govern our economy today entails escaping from the anthropological measure to which the world tends to be subjected when it is narrated. So the fear index continually recenters its human characters through its recourse to genre. At the same time, there are certain moments in the book where Vixal 4 appears through the actions of human beings whom it manipulates. Humans, in other words, appear as the proxies of Vixal 4. They appear as the algorithmic puppets of Vixal 4. And it is these moments of partial anthropic inversion, of inadvertent steerage. In these moments, we can see the fear index begin to indicate 
the mode of what Jody Dean calls commanded individualism, the mode by which algorithms govern today's digitized economy. Okay, so I'm going to conclude. So we can see both in the regulators, in the experts, in the popular novelists, and in popular television, the fear around the flash crash and around HFT, around high-frequency trading, is its propagative capacity for virally spreading, destabilizing movements. The nightmare is that high-frequency trading is a non-human force that is capable of destroying and then resurrecting trillions of dollars of market value. But as Alexander Galloway and Eugene Thacker argue, it's not that high-frequency trading is out of control. On the contrary, it works only too well. It does exactly what its job is. And between these two readings of networks that are out of control and networks that work too well, this valence of the broken and the fun fully functioning, the functioning that functions too well, between these two points is where the trickster inserts themselves. That's to say, this is where the trader who knows HFT, who knows how to manipulate the complex ecology of HFT, can use deception and opportunism in order to overcome and manipulate the market. In other words, HFT has a questionable ethical status. And so what I want to do is just end briefly on this. Let me listen to that. Brian Chilcote is in West London today at the Hounslow home of Navinder Saral, the UK trader that I mentioned arrested and waiting extradition to the US. Uh, Ryan, set the scene for us at his home here. What do we know about this man? Yeah, Betty, well, you know, uh, first off, let me tell you, this neighborhood is perhaps best known for being directly beneath the flight path to Heathrow Airport, which I'm sure you've been to. You know, it's, it's one of the world's busiest. So you can imagine just exactly there we have the plane on cue taking off from the airport, how loud and noisy it is here. Not exactly, Betty, the kind of place you would expect to find a high-flying trader with enough weight to cause a market crash. But that is exactly what U.S. prosecutors are alleging. They say that uh, Navinder Saro, uh, operating out of his family home right across the street where all the media has gathered out in front, uh, back in uh, 2010, on May the 6th, the day of the so-called flash crash, was actually uh, employing illegal trading strategies uh, that uh, reaped him on that day $900,000 in profit. And they say that it didn't begin there. It actually began in 2009 and carried all the way right through to 2014. Uh, winning them about 40 million bucks in, in illicit gains. Pretty hard for people in this neighborhood to get their head around. This is a real working class neighborhood. Many of the people know the Soro family, very close knit uh, family, and everyone's saying really good things about him, about how he played in the street when he was a kid. People haven't really seen him too much recently, except for when he was arrested here yesterday. But it is a big development here in West London. Uh, it is, and I see people behind you milling about, Ryan. Uh, you know, so a lot of the action happened yeah. yesterday. He was arrested, uh, and he's actually not there. He, you know, he was at the hearing today. So, what exactly is going on behind you? I mean, what exactly is going on in the neighborhood here? You know, I mean, that's a good question. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is that uh, the media that has gathered in front of his house are hoping to get any little detail about uh, Narendra Saro that, the Narendra Saro that they can. Uh, no one in the media yet has any photos of him, uh, very few details about him. And, you know, I've been standing here for about five, six hours, and literally, you know, reporters have knocked on every single door on the street to learn anything they can. And what I think is particularly uh, surprising, Betty, is that very few of the neighbors know anything about 
uh, Navinder uh, himself. They, mm. they know about the family and they say they're nice, kept to themselves. But he's not uh, someone who really uh, chatted a lot with people here. And so they're all just a little bit surprised that, you know, if you really did, as the U.S. prosecutors allege, make 40 million bucks, you know, three people have now said to me, well, then why the heck is he still living on our street? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, he made it illegally, right? So he's not going to want to start buying uh, the Bentleys and the, uh, you know, and the private planes quite yet. Ryan, thank you so much for joining us. Ryan Choco there in West London. Thanks, Ryan. <laughs> okay. Confusion, tension, uncertainty, focus. Using interactive workers' training programs to the worst training products and opportunities on the Okay. It's been got by the machine. So I've got, so I've got to wrap up. So, 21st April 2015, the United States District Court, Northern District of Eastern Illinois, issues a criminal complaint for the arrest of Navinder Singh Rao, a trader based in Hounslow in West London, who's used an automatic, automated trading program to manipulate the market. Sing Rao, age 37, is accused of using a dynamic layering scheme. Layering is a type of spoofing, a form of manipulative high-speed activity in the financial markets. In a layering scheme, a trader places multiple bogus orders that the trader does not intend to have executed. For example, multiple orders to sell a financial product at different price points and then quickly modifies or cancels those orders before they are executed. The purpose of these bogus orders is to trick other participants and to manipulate the product's market price by creating a false appearance of increased supply and thereby depressing its market price. The trader seeks to mislead and deceive investors investors by communicating false pricing signals to the market to create a false impression of how market participants value a financial product and thus to prevent legitimate forces of supply and demand from operating properly. The trader does so by creating a false appearance of market debt with intent to create artificial price movement. The trader then exploits this layering activity by simultaneously ex executing other real trades in an attempt to profit from the artificial price movements that the trader has created. Such layering and trading activities occurs over the course of seconds in multiple cycles that the trader repeats throughout the trading day. Given the speed and near simultaneity of market activity in a successful layering scheme, such schemes are aided by custom programmed automated trading software. Thank you.